So I think in today's environment, personalization is more than, I just know what you like. I know what you prefer in your products or services. I'm learning more about your behavior and your habits of what makes you want to buy, what triggers you and influences you. That's personalization truly in, my, in the environment today. Welcome to the Agents of Change, the podcast experience you've been waiting for your entire marketing career. Search, social, mobile, AI, blockchain, and neuromarketing. These are the Agents of Change, and so are you. Digital marketing success awaits, and your transformation begins now. Welcome to another episode of the Agents of Change podcast. The podcast is here to help you reach and engage more of your ideal customers online so you can generate more leads and more sales at your website. My name is Rich Brooks. I'm your host. This is episode 527, powered by the Agents of Change Digital Marketing Summit. Years ago, years ago, I can't remember exactly when, but Amazon was still a novelty and Prime hadn't been introduced yet. It was still primarily an online bookstore. There was this article about a woman who had purchased some books from Amazon, and when she returned sometime later to buy more, the site remembered her name and welcomed her. Hello, Cheryl, whatever it was. She was appalled, appalled, I tell you. She couldn't believe the audacity of the website and the invasion of her personal privacy that Amazon would know her name and welcome her back. She swore in this article that she would never purchase from them again. I have no idea who this woman was, although I'm sure Amazon does, but I'm guessing she got over it. These days, despite concerns over privacy, we welcome personalization. I expect Netflix to recommend action and superhero movies when I log in and true crime and documentaries when my girlfriend does. I expect a mix of hard rock and yacht rock when I jump into my car and tell Siri, play music I like. And when I go to Amazon, I expect it to make recommendations based on all my purchases to date. The bottom line is that we expect and desire personalization on our websites. And as website owners, we can improve the customer experience with personalization, all while helping our own business succeed as well. Today, we're going to be talking about personalization elements for your website. But first, a reminder about our upcoming virtual summit the Agents of Change Digital Marketing Summit coming April 24th through 26th. Behind the scenes, me and my team at Flight New Media have been hustling to get everything ready for our first ever summit. No matter how much time we thought we had, no matter how prepared we thought we were, there is still so much more to get done, including getting the website ready for people who want to attend the event on April 24th through 26th. We're configuring the shopping cart, the streaming platform, getting up virtual booths for our sponsors, pages for our speakers, confirmation emails, welcome messages, the list goes on. But I think it's going to pay off. We have 30 amazing speakers on a wide variety of topics that are all designed to help you reach and engage more of your ideal customers online. SEO, Facebook ads, GA4, TikTok, uh, branding, social media strategy, LinkedIn, digital ads, and a whole lot more. This episode is dropping the day before we officially open registration, so I'm not going to push you to pre-register anymore, but I do want to remind you that although the event is free to attend, yeah, I know, unbelievable, right? 30 speakers free to attend. You're going to want to grab one of our VIP upgrades, which are 50% off on Thursday, March 21st, and then 25% off for the rest of the week. Oh, and if you upgrade on day one, you're going to be entered to win a $100 Amazon gift card or one of three one-hour consults with me, normally $500 each. So you definitely want to get in there and you definitely want to grab your VIP upgrades on day one. Again, that's March 21st, 2024. Don't hesitate. Don't miss out. Head on over to theagentsofchange.com right now and get your discounted upgrades. Now, let's get personal in this week's interview. My guest today brings over 20 years of experience in e-commerce, business strategy, digital analytics, and marketing. He's held leadership roles at companies like Best Buy, Dick's Sporting Goods, Dickies, and the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. He's known for his innovative strategies in digital marketing and e-commerce, which are based on data-driven insights and apply to various business sectors. In the academic world, he's a professor and mentor, teaching subjects like digital marketing and business strategies at respective universities. 
He has also contributed to academic literature and has a strong educational background with degrees in business and communication. Today, we're going to be looking at how you can create humanistic connections in e-commerce through personalization with Dr. Kyle Allison, a.k.a. the Doctor of Digital Strategy. Kyle, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate that. And I'm so glad to be here today. Okay, so personalization means different things to different people. How do you define it in this context? In this context of today's environment, personalization is more than just the offer and the value of what you're offering. It's the connection that you know the customer more intimately. You know more about their ethos, their emotions, their attitudes. I look at it as a consumer behavior kind of class. You know, we, we teach in that class attitudes, behaviors, the decision-making process of what goes through their minds and their beliefs. So I think in today's environment, personalization is more than, I just know what you like. I know what you prefer in your products or services. I'm learning more about your behavior and your habits of what makes you want to buy, what triggers you and influences you. That's personalization truly in, my, in the environment today. So whenever I think of e-commerce, Amazon's always one of the first companies I think mm-hmm. of. And I think that's one that we're all familiar with, even if we can't quite replicate their business model and their success on our own websites. But what are are there examples from Amazon that you can pull from so we can kind of wrap our heads around what level of personalization might be achievable? Yeah. So Amazon, you know, obviously, you know, we all see when we log into Amazon, if we have history with Amazon, they're going to show you on their homepage front and center products that you've looked at or bought before and similar brands and products like that. What they're doing fairly well, I'm sure, is modeling, though, beyond that time and place. When did you look at this seasonality kind of things? You know, they're not going to have you look at something for outdoor apparel in the middle of, let's say, winter, you know, that kind of thing. They're going to do it at the right time, right season. And then we look at your history from back last winter when you bought winter accessories and bring it to you at the right time to buy that. So they're good at that. I think when you look at Amazon or a major website who really understands personalization today. They're looking at, though, what did you do before the purchase? What was your path to purchase? You know, really leveraging Google Analytics or Adobe Web Analytics and really understanding the path and what you took along the way. But there's an added value, though, to something that we're going to talk about in a minute on building your own data set beyond, though, just the clicks and the views and the purchases. That's something you're going to get, I call it descriptively. You're already getting that with the actions your customers online take that take place. But we have to do something more than that to understand the more of our these call attributes of our customer behavior, which was what we're going to talk about here in just a minute. So let's talk about attributes. So what do you mean when you're talking about this? What is beyond my purchase history when I go to an e-commerce store? And if I'm running an e-commerce store, what things can I start to pay attention to so I can deliver a better experience for the people who come to shop with me? Absolutely. So attributes are really your characteristics of how you define your customer profiles, right? We already know enough about them as far as what they bought, what they viewed, what they clicked. And we know that views and clicks do show interest and intent. That's the classic model of personalization and just tracking customer behavior online. What I'm talking about, though, is getting tapping into the belief systems, the attitudes, like truly, do they do they value us as a brand or company or not? And truly more on their interest level as well. I mean, we can give surveys, right? Sure, that's classic. Give a survey, ask questions, but that's not really the best way of doing it. In today's environment, if you develop tests of personalization, you develop a forum for where you're actually communicating with them and learning directly about those attributes, which are characteristics of your customer. But you need to define it the way you need to define it for your customer, however you want to define it, whether it's a passive shopper, we call a loyal customer. What does loyalty really even mean? Are they loyal because they love the brand? They love the product? We're just, you know, we're good to them. And you can start taking a lower level step in attributes and really understanding how to code them, if you will. When I say coding, not programming, I mean, label them in your data the way you want to define them. I can give an example. An online foot, a footwear retailer I know of actually use their chatbots as more than a service, like handling customer service issues. They went on there and actually had a conversation midway through the, the shopping experience for their customers. I call it midpoint funnel. As they started tracking the behavior of a user on their website and what shoes they were looking at, maybe brand, style, they'd have a chatbot pop-up called Fashion Friend and, and our footwear Fashion Friend that said, hi, I see you're searching dance shoes. Can you tell me more about what your event looks like? And they actually started in a dialogue with some chatbot AI asking them, what type of dance are you going to? Oh, it is a outdoor event. Well, here's some shoes 
We recommend for it being outdoors. But through that dialogue, if you will, we're gathering data now. We're curating our own data and building our own data sets around the behaviors of our users based on what they're telling us via a chatbot is one medium to do that. And there's other ways to do it. But this is an example. But through that dialogue too, we may learn about, hey, they actually prefer a brand that has sustainable shoe fabric, right? So maybe the conversation is, what else is important to you about these pair of shoes? The customer may say, I want environmentally friendly. Well, they recommend not just the product that serves that, but now we can label that customer under our environmental friendly, conscious customer, sustainable customer, if you want. So this is what I'm saying. You can build these experiences and then learn how to absorb more information from your customers and then build that data to your advantage to take something called hyper-personalization to take it to the next level. So that's an example of things you can do. So as you're describing this, like I could see when uh, when companies are first starting out, or we'll just stick with the shoe mm-hmm. company. So a mm-hmm. shoe company might say, okay, do we want people who are more interested in outdoor gear or just you know dress gear or business gear? And we start, and that may be some of the codes or the tags that we start to apply to our own database of information, our first person data, if you will. But then we might even get more specialized over time, or maybe if we're focused on a specific niche, then we start doing even more of these tags and we start to get information, if I'm understanding this correctly, not just about that individual who we can better serve, but we're also getting a better understanding of all of our clients and may be able to provide better recommendations to them as well. Is that correct? Absolutely. So we can tag, like you said, the straightforward actions they take on a website, the events, if you will, as Google classifies it, of a click of view. But if we get more with the dialogue in a chatbot or more of a form of a webinar or we're engaging with our customers, we get more of a, yes, it's a sample. We get better at understanding their lifestyle, the needs of their products beyond just they want it because of a good price, maybe the durability and the look of a, of a pair of shoes. There's more that there's behind a customer's intent. Now, not all customers, we're going to understand everything about them, but we can get better at learning more about them through these curated digital experiences. And a lot of it is, for a, let's say, a first-time website, it's just learning how to do personalization first. Let's don't get me wrong. You have to kind of set up the tool, learn the basic mechanics of personalization, which is tracking views, clicks, purchase history, and making recommendations from that. But once we're really good at that, the next step up is let's do some testing on some curated, right, our own customized experiences and build a forum to learn more about these extra layers of interest for our customers. And really what you're doing is you're, at, you're, at, you're adding more value to your data to return better experiences moving forward. And absolutely, once you have the right sample size of customers you've learned from, you can turn that into full-blown strategies at that point. Personalization is a place to go one-to-one, but you can also learn from that how to make things better all in over time. You, You can take further marketing ads on the site or what to promote better too, and not just that time and place for that customer. You can build long-term campaign strategies based off the learning of that personalization you're doing. Now, we've talked about Amazon a few times, and obviously, I doubt that the lead programmers at Amazon are tuned into this podcast, but maybe they are. Hello. Hello. But for most of our listeners, I think that they're running their e-commerce shops on platforms we're all familiar with, like Shopify or BigCommerce, WooCommerce, what have you. Are those tools robust enough to do this, or are there add-ons or plugins that you have used that you recommend that would put this type of technology and personalization in the hands of the people listening to this podcast? So the fundamental personalization, some of these platforms that you mentioned do some basic recommendations, and it's probably going to be, you know, like I talked about, the fundamentals of if the customer saw this, they also bought that, or you know, some basic rule setting. So the thing is, it's all goes down to the very narrow, the types of rules you're allowed to use as the e-commerce, as the store owner, whatever you want to call it, the person who's going to be behind the scenes, what do they have access to, the business user, right? And it's all about the number of, of available rules you can set for your personalization. Some of these platforms will have a very possibly either it's an, and some of them may be an add-on service for you know a, a little bit more of an investment, but it can be built in. Or there's programs out there, softwares that are specializing in this. Like Monetate is a big company that does this. They're 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 top in the game. Optimizely is another one. AB Tasty. So there's a few there. I would say can do more. They have more rules you can do. They actually have other types of data built in, like weather built in, right? As an example, and seasonality of your customers or where they are based off weather. They have other things like 
the one that actually tracks the stock market and how does that impact customer behavior around a certain industry, customers react a certain way. So there are some other variables they can bring in to help you hyper-personalize this at the next level. So I would say they'll get familiar with what's already available to you first. Learn the fundamentals of personalization there before you go invest into the, let's say, the, the upper echelon of personalization tools, unless you're ready to go. Once you have some history, you can go. So um, like I said, there is some out of the box, I call it, but there are also tools out there like Monetate, Optimizely, who specialize in this at the next level. And these tools that you mentioned, are they e-commerce platforms unto themselves, or are they more like they integrate with the platforms that we may have already set up our stores on? They're going to integrate for the most part. Monetate is owned by, I should know this, they have their own commerce sister company, if you will, under their platform, but they add on to any any e-commerce platform out there. So the commerce part is what we're talking about, like a Shopify and WooCommerce and all that. It's uh, These are the personalization tools. Do they, they will say, well, we have our own commerce platform. You don't need to have that, though, to do the personalization. It's a it, They integrate with it. But you run all your personalization on, your, on their tool. What's good about these tools, though, too, is they have a staging area where you can view what you want the experience to look like before you hit the trigger. And a lot of them have the in inside of them the analytics themselves, right? So you don't, you know, you can use you can plug it into Google Analytics if you want or whatever platform of analytics, but they have their own monetary, it's really good. They have their own set of analytics. And what it comes down to is you can actually build customized rules. So the value of these add-on tools is like I said before, you may be limited on the ones that are just kind of built in or the basic personalization. These other ones allow you to curate very specific rules. If you wanted to add in multiple layers of rules, like this customer who is price conscious, only when they see a price between $29.99 and $39.99 promote the product. And it's like very specific, right? Like for a price as an example, anytime our price is above $39.99, do not show that product. But if it's on promotion, it triggers an automated personalization, then promote it, right? We only know this customer shops between these hours of the day and only when these brands are, are showcased. Get more specific around time of day, brands and the rules are way more granular, which is good if you have a very strong mix of products and a lot of diverse customers. Obviously, you know, if you have a very straightforward brand with a small set of products and a very small segment of customers, what I mean by small, not scalability, I'm talking characteristics, your personalization is more now more of a good feel, right? So personalization isn't just promoting products. It's how do I connect with you on a brand level? Uh, We call it brand love, right? How do I make sure you feel like Hey Kyle, you're on the website. I mean, how are you today? There is that element, which is part of this. But from a true sales perspective, it's getting very specific on ensuring the right attitudes are understood by your customers. Even like things like what do they have interest in as far as maybe politics is an example. You could try to figure out a way to say what products serve what political views of a customer if you have that savviness. So it gets down to that level of detail for the most part. It sounds pretty customizable. You use the word granular. So I'm just trying to envision in my head as we're gathering this data and I'm using these tools, it sounds like I'm assigning tags like eco-conscious or socially conscious or budget conscious. I assume there's also some preset ones that you can do, but am I Mm -hmm. manually applying these to different shoppers, or is this more of like an AI play where it sees the behavior and it makes some good guesses, and then I can kind of correct it if I don't think it's if it's on target? It's going to be, you need to, most of the time, you need to define it yourself first. What are the parameters? And then when the parameters are met, then those customers who follow that parameter, the AI will absorb that and then provide the possibly recommended experience And it's not just products, it's the banner, it's the ad, whatever, but you need to define up front what those characteristics are. AI can definitely bring you back the results of previous experiences, for sure, of what you've done before, and you can assess it that way. But when I say granular, the only reason I mean granular is you're not really doing a lot of manual work. You are building the granular, more defined, if you will, that's probably the better word, defined set of characteristics about your customers or the experience that you want to understand better. So that's the more narrow part. But once you have that done and it's tagged, then yeah, all the absorption around that, any online user who fits that character set of characteristics we talked about, attributes, they'll be served that experience, which is which is good because you want that. You want to know even newer customers coming in who fits that criteria so they can kind of be part of that segment for the most part. 
You mentioned uh, banners and ads in passing, and so it brings up a good question. So obviously, these things will impact the experience once somebody's on the website, but is there a way to optimize our ad campaigns or email marketing campaigns using these same tools, or does it start and stop at the website? I'm actually really glad you asked that. One of the things I, when I just when I teach and when I consult on e-commerce is like your e-commerce website in general, this is about advertising in general, personalization tools or not, whether you do it on your own analytics on your own without AI, your website has so much rich information about what your customers think, feel, say even, if they use on-site search, you know, and all these other things that you your the functionality website can do. You, you need to absorb that data and that information really and insight and bring it back to the outbound marketing like you just talked about, email, social, whatnot, Google ads, because that's already what the people on your destination are saying. I feel like we focus so much on the top of the funnel, what's working, not working out there, right? Between the different channels, which is what you need to do. You need to manage your outbound channels, but we don't take the insights for what's happening on the website to say, well, if it works here on the website and we have all this information about what they prefer, what they do, what's triggering them to want to buy or not buy. Well, obviously the stuff that they, we, we want to use what's triggering them to buy, bring that back out to the fold, send emails out there to that same customer group. If they're logged in, of course, you know who they are on personalizing your emails that way, or take a shot. If you have enough of a sample size to a new audience thinking, well, they fit the same set of characteristics and segmentation. So yes, absolutely bring that back in. So yes, the long story is yes, you can. I just want to reiterate though, I feel like in general though, even if you're not using AI and personalization, you can take your descriptive track record of what's happening on your website with all this user behavior, even with the general Google Analytics view, you get on your default view and say, well, I have something. I know they click here, they view these pages, that content that they like, they seem to like that they're converting from, bring that out because more people will see that. And obviously we know that, you know, with the quality score of Google, Google ads or just search in general, it's got to, it's got to, the click has to make sense to the link. That's fundamental. We understand that as digital marketers, but for those who don't understand that has to be done. Your landing page for e-commerce has to match whatever you put out there for Google to say, yeah, this, this makes sense. So yes, long story short, yes, it's my passion subject, actually. How do you connect the inbound and outbound strategically? And that's really learning from the inbound more than just the outbound. Yep. All right. You mentioned that you can just start with some of the basic things that are on the platforms that listeners may already be familiar with. How do you know when you're ready to add an optimizely or monetate to the website? Is there a trigger that you might recommend when you get to a certain point that this is when you should be investigating or implementing some of these more higher end personalization tactics? It really goes down to your level of operational maturity. Are you really using personalization as a regular tool, strategic planning tool? Are you looking at it every now and then? If you're just ad hoc, then I would say you're not ready yet. You need to make a commitment, right? It's really about that. Are you integrating this as part of your ongoing business review, uh, process development, strategic planning, whatever you want to call it? It's got to be part of your day-to-day, week-to-week mentality. Now, personalization, of course, up front takes time for the results to really showcase itself. I mean, personalization is not a campaign like, hey, one day campaign, you're going to see all this data and understand it because personalization is based off a score, which is a metric that you're evaluating. Well, experiences take time to marinate. So you have to be patient with personalization first off. Understand it may take a week, two weeks sometimes for a test to truly get a confidence level and say, yeah, we believe in this test or not. It's working. It's not working. But otherwise, yeah, the investments on, on you, if you're really going to do it. So that's one, number one. I think that's just your maturity as an organization to say, I will not just invest into it, I'm going to actually use it. It's also if you're getting some good results off your foundational personalization. What I mean is, have you seen something convert better? Have you seen some growth in some metric from the fundamental personalization you're doing? If not, I would say keep trying to figure out the fundamentals first and see where you can make some wins. Because if you're not winning in the fundamentals, it's going to be harder for you to understand how to win in the advanced stuff. Right. And use stuff is such a general word, but you know what I mean? It's like that to me is what's important. And then from there, you have to have a decent customer base of returning traffic. If you're not growing your traffic organically, I would wait too, because organic traffic, even a little bit of organic traffic is what you need for these personalization tools to work. Because what happens if you're not growing your organic traffic or growing your traffic period in new traffic, 
your retention of personalization becomes kind of saturated. It's the same mix of customers with the same behavior. So hopefully you have somewhat of a growth plan on top of using personalization on the website. Now you can use the personalization, like I said a minute ago with you to bring that back out to grow new traffic, but you need somewhat of a foundation of growth. And that's, it really come, depends on you know the numbers and all that. But if you're not growing, you're not gonna learn new personalization because you're gonna have the same regurgitation of personalization to the same customers over and over. And at that point, it's kind of like, well, how often are your customers gonna need to buy from you anyways? So it's a mix of both traffic levels and uh, how you're gonna implement it and use it. It seems like this could take quite a bit of our time. I could definitely see going down a rabbit hole with, with some of this. What do you think is a recommended amount of time that somebody should expect to be working on these tools, a range each week mm-hmm. or each month? Yeah, so if you are a small team, privately you know, you're, you're one person or a small team of less than 10, you need to have someone devoted to it first off, right? Someone needs to be that, I call it either personalization or AB specialist. Someone needs to be the owner of the tool, like anything else, right? So there's that, define that person. Otherwise, no one's gonna know who's doing what and it gets mixed up and all that organizational stuff. I would say to start, you really only need uh, you know a few hours a week. I think, you know, to learn the tool, it may take you know some training, a couple of weeks or so. I think some of these companies will, will should provide that or offer it to you. So work with them first off on their training plan. It might take, you know, a couple of weeks or so to be trained on it, but to start some strategies, just set up a handful, right? Get a few out there, three, four, five of them, and just let it do its thing for a couple of weeks or so. It may not take that long for it to actually say, Hey, you got a winning score. If you have enough traffic, it's all about traffic. Again, it goes really, that's a big deal. You need the population to learn from, but anyways, a few hours a week. And then if you get really good at it, some websites, they run dozens, if not maybe hundreds of tests, and the personalization strategies at one time, you'll need a full-time resource at that point, right? That do this day in and day out. Maybe they have other responsibilities, but you want to monitor your results weekly. You're not going to do a lot of day-to-day, I'd say, changes of your tests or personalization. So you're not really saying every day you need to spend hours on it, but you need to assess it at least once a week and then make changes as you see fit. Sometimes it could be in that week when you look at the results of one personalization versus another, I maybe pivot it or I don't. You let you keep letting it going. So up front, a few hours a week, three to four maybe. And then over time, it could be someone's part-time job because they're doing more tests, more evaluation, more decision makers that need to come involved. So the more you do, the longer it's going to take. So up front, a few hours. After that, it really is a resource. Someone's going to have to do it you know, part-time or full-time. All right. This has been really enlightening. Kyle, if people want to learn more about Dr. Kyle Allison, see what you're up to, follow you, connect with you, where can we send them? Sure. Doctorofdigitalstrategy.com. Everything's there. All right. And we'll have links to that in the show notes. Kyle, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Yes. Loved it. Thank you so much. For a full transcript of my interview with Kyle, as well as all the show notes, the takeaways, and all the links that he shared with us, head on over to our website at theagentsofchange.com slash 527. And when you're there, grab your registration, grab your VIP pass to our first ever digital marketing summit coming your way on April 24th through 26th. You don't want to miss it, and you're going to be upset with yourself if you have to pay full price. So go ahead and grab the, assuming that you want a VIP upgrade. Again, the event itself is free. You can watch every single session for free. But if you do want all the benefits of downloads and transcripts and on-demand videos and just the audio file so you can listen in your car, as well as all the VIP upgrades that you'll find on the mastery level VIP from all of our speakers, you're going to want to upgrade and you're want to you're going to want to take advantage of those early bird discounts. So go ahead, head on over to the website, take care of that now. You'll thank me later. It's all part of your journey to become an agent of change. Don't miss another thrilling episode of the Agents of Change podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform.